Welcome to Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Nwako, your host for this evening and every other Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Thank you so much for joining today's episode as we're going to be talking all about livestock auctions and market fair pricing. We're speaking to a young agripreneur and um, he's going to be teaching us about how do we purchase um, uh, livestock in auctions, what his business is about, and maybe the do's and don'ts as a livestock farmer, whether you're upcoming or seasoned farmer on what to do when uh, we interact with auctions or auction houses and I must say that he's a winner or was a was a finalist and a winner with the um, SAB social impact awards within 2021 so congratulations to him I'm so excited to obviously speak to young entrepreneurs who are doing amazing things winning awards and being recognized for the work that they do which hardly doesn't come by as often as we'd like to see but yeah if you have any questions for our guests this evening, uh, please feel free to ask questions, comment, like, share below. Continue to subscribe to the podcast on our YouTube channel. And you can also ask questions, post the show and reach out to him. So without further ado, let's get straight on to the show. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm um, good. Thanks. And you? Awesome. I'm super fantastic. Um, so you're the managing director of Lizwe Meat, right? Tell us about yes. your organization and give us a brief overview of your operations. So uh, Lizwe Meat is the first black youth owned livestock auctioning company in South Africa. So what we do is that we provide market access for your emerging, your communal and your commercial farmers. Um, basically, we uh, for aggregate the, the market because we, farmers sometimes are located in dispersed areas and it becomes difficult to reach the market so we bring the market closer to them yeah. right and the market in this specific case is auctions Basically, we, we bring the market, uh, we look at the, the market kilo, which is uh, national determined, and then the animals which the farmers bring in, weigh them times by the national kilo, and then the buyers bid based on the quality of the animal. And then our second aspect of our business will be buy wieners or dollies. These are your calves, which we buy at uh, market determined prices at weight, bring our scale, weigh it, and then we pay the farmers electronically. So, yeah. 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 So what type of farmers do you deal with in terms of size or operations, right? You did say small scale merging, but where cattle are concerned, is there a specific number that you want to start to do business with? And is there a specific breed that you particularly look out for when you're purchasing cattle from the farmers? Well, when it comes to weaners, it's all about the weight. And uh, because we sell to feedlots, feedlots want a specific type of frame of animal. Those are your Ponsmara type frame animals. It doesn't have to be specific in the Ponsmara. It might be a, a, another animal crossed with the Ponsmara to get that frame. So with regards to the type of farmers we, 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 we do business with, it's a farmer who has 10. Some farmers have two cattle. Some guys are starting out right to your commercial farmers with hundreds of cattle. So we don't discriminate as to who it is and, uh, and also uh, do business across different ratios. So black, white, Indian, colored, yeah, everything. Yeah. With the farmers that you're on board, like you said, some have two, some have just asked, have 10, some are just starting out. Take us through the process. So let's say I'm a livestock farmer. I've got five cattle um, and they are born smara. How do I then start to do business with Lizwe Meat? Is there a contract? Is there an offtake agreement? Do you assist me in growing the cattle so that, you know, we can have weaners? Basically, how does that relationship uh, come about? So what usually happens is uh, the farmers usually hear about the auctions and they come physically. Because uh, the, the areas which we work in, the reception tends to be quite bad. So some of the farmers are not techn technologically advanced. So they also want to see. So that's how it usually starts out. And then over time at the auction, they see, okay, I might be farming with a Nguni type animal, which is a thin frame. And then they see at the auction, okay, that animal went for more than my animal and why you know and then we start we have that engagement as to you know this speed is what people like in terms of the the, the a grade in south africa 
but your pre does not say it's of poor quality. Is this what the African guys want when they do the cultural uh, uh, ceremonies? So it's it's that aspect, and then also educating them on the informal market as well, which which most of the time they tend to sell to the informal market, whereas mm-hmm. we sell to the the formal market, which goes according to kilo and weight. Because what you find sometimes as well, a guinea type animal, a fully grown guinea type animal, might weigh three hundred fifty kgs, whereas a weaner of a ponsmara type uh, weighs about two hundred between two hundred and twenty two hundred and forty kgs, and yeah. uh, and you and calculate the growth rate, then Gwini took about, let's say, three years, and the winner took seven months. So in terms of business, the, the selling the winners is more consistent cash flow. So it's, it's, it's also looking at what the farmer wants to do as well, because some farmers want the, the, the Nguni type because they are stronger in the informal market, you see, mm. because the informal market doesn't look at the weight. They look at what the, the cultural um, ceremony requires, you see. Mm-hmm. Mm. How often do these livestock auctions happen? Do they occur every week, every month? And if so, then how do you manage the demand with your farmers so that you can obviously have cattle to auction? Right now, it's every two months because okay. the area which we're located in is Fort Cox College. or so, yeah, basically, it's next to Fort Cox College in the Eastern Cape. And the surrounding farmers don't have the commercial farmer numbers, to be exact. Mm. So what we do is every two months, we hold an auction. So with regards to managing the, the demand, we have a register where we get the, the estimate number, we get the farmers to sign in the estimate numbers. These are the guys surrounding the area because the commercial farmers is easy to call a farmer and say, okay, we have an auction coming up. Then they'll mm-hmm. bring 50, for example, overnight. Whereas mm-hmm. a commer- uh, sorry, whereas an informal f- farmer might need to understand, okay, there's an auction coming out and then they need to uh, prepare and maybe some of them might want to feed or might want to go to the call and select. You know, it's, 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 it's uh, when you deal with the commercial farmer, they understand lands and mm. But the, the upstart guys, or the, the, the communal farmers, the informal or the emerging farmers, it's, mm. it's kind of difficult because they have a kind of cultural connotation or they have that emotional attachment to the animals. So it, it's a bit longer, but it works in the end. Mm. Tell us about the 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 the, the prices in, in in an auction house. So um, you know, do you get how does it work? Do you get a price for the cattle, and then what are the other hidden costs that we don't typically see? So are there fees involved? You know, like I can relate it to the fresh produce market when a farmer. Uh, a, a, a vegetable or a fruit farmer sends their produce to the fresh produce market. Um, you deal with an agent and there's a commission. And then there's also, there's a commission for the agent and there's a commission for the market floor. So from an auction perspective, how does that translate to when buying cattle? Does the farmer get the price for the cattle? And also what are the other extra fees associated within an auction, uh, within an auction house? So, I'm going to look at it from both aspects now. So for a guy who's selling livestock, um, because we provide the market, uh, you, you pay commission. So basically, let's say your, your animal was 16000 and the commission for that day, let's say it's what, 8%. So it's 10000 minus 8%. That's what we'll reflect in your bank account. And then uh, from the buyer side, uh, oh, sorry, man, from, from the... The seller side as well. What you must understand again, because you are transporting to the, the auction site, there's also uh, money out of pocket which you, you need to forego because you might go, you might transport your livestock to the auction and then the price which you get there you do not agree with because mm. at the end of the day, the market price is not determined by the individual. It's determined by the market. Let's say the kilo for Seagrave for that week, for example, is 26 rand and your animal weighs 300, for example. So it's 26 rand times 300, and that's where the bidding starts. It might go higher, it might go lower, but that depends on the quality of your animal. So mm-hmm. as a farmer, you need to guard your quality. So in terms of, 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 of understanding your business, it sort of focuses your, 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 your production in terms of quality. Now, as a, as, a, as, a, as a buyer, you first and foremost need to be able to transport your livestock, which you have bought from, from the auction house. Uh, some, some guys give you a day. It uh, depends a uh, couple of hours, but you need to bring a trailer or organize transport beforehand. So uh, should I take you through the bidding process and, and, and sure, the like? So, yeah. Absolutely. We'd like to know. <laughs> so, so as a farmer selling livestock, uh, your, your animal goes, 
goes on to the the the, the pen or the, the the stage, and then from there on the bedding starts and it goes up, it goes down. But before the sale is concluded, you the the, the auctioneer will look at you to confirm whether you're happy with the price or not. And then from there, if you agree, that's the price it gets sold at. Now, as a buyer, you see a uh, nice cattle there and you like the price and another bidder next to you also likes the, the quality. So you bid according to the price of the animal and that's how it mm-hmm. goes up and that becomes more beneficial. Why? Because mm-hmm. now these buyers are not from the same area. They, they are strictly bidding on the quality of the animal. Mm-hmm. So, and mm-hmm. once the, 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 sell, uh, once the, the seller has agreed, the buyer then transfer, rather goes to the office either transfers or does EFT. From there, we get the printer remittance, which basically states this animal is moving from uh, seller to, to purchaser so that if they get transported, or sorry, if they get stopped by uh, uh, stock theft, at least they have a uh, uh, document to identify that this animal belongs to me now. And then from the seller side, you also get a remittance stating, okay, this is the amount the animal sold for, deduct the commission, this is what I expect to land in my EFT. Or bank, yeah. Yeah. I think also, do you only focus on cattle or do you then uh, also branch out to more small holdings like your goats and the sheep? It's all livestock. Um, but with the past auctions, because the area which we focus on, we hold our auctions is mostly like uh, cattle. So people assume it's only cattle. It's everything. I mean, yeah. it's chickens, pigs, goats and sheep. Yeah. yeah. So all livestock. Wow. So how can farmers ensure that they get the best price for their livestock? You know, you mentioned about when, 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 the, when, the, when the animal gets to the auction house, it has, you know, everybody has to look at it. And then, you know, the buyer must say, I like it. It looks healthy. It, it, you know, it looks great. Maybe it's, 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 it, it weighs enough uh, kilograms. So how can the farmer ensure that uh, they have the right animal um, at the right quality for a buyer to attract a buyer at the end of the day. So what are the, what are the advices that you could give to a farmer on the ground to ensure that they're raising the right cattle, sheep, goats, uh, pigs, chickens, etc. at quality? The biggest thing is understanding what you want to serve because if you want to serve the informal market, you have to breed according to what the informal market wants. If you want mm-hmm. to breed towards the the commercial market, you must be to what the commercial market wants. And that, necess- most of the time, it, it, it uh, points to genetics. So mm-hmm. let's say in your area as well, because the environment differs across South Africa. In the Eastern Cape, you have areas where it rains mostly, and it's green most of the time. And then you have other areas which are semi type. So you can't necessarily breed uh, a larger frame animal in those conditions. Why? Because the genetics are not... Uh, uh, will not suit that environment. Whereas in that environment, you might want to get your Nguni type animals, your Brahman cattle, those animals which are adapted and hardier and, they can, and can survive drier, drier areas. So again, it depends where you're located and where you want to go. Because mm-hmm. if you're located in a, an area which rains quite often and is quite green, I would uh, suggest you go towards the larger frame animals. That's, that way you ensure you're getting more, more land per, per hectare in terms of uh, feed. Mm. And if you are, you, are up, you are located in a dry area, that means you you must, most likely will encounter droughts more frequently than, than not. So you yeah. need to farm yeah. I- with your smaller frame animals and the uh, hardy animals as well. So yeah. yeah. You mentioned a lot of preparation that goes around the formal market auctioning, right? Um, there's obviously preparation from the seller side, there's preparation from the buyer side. And, you know, the buyer's, um, at a formal market auction, look for a specific breed, quality, weight, size, etc. How does that differ in terms of the informal market? Does the preparation is the preparation still the same, or uh, you know, are there certain things from an uh, from an informal market that is vastly different to the formal market? And if there are, please can you point some of those out for us? Yes. Um... With regards to the formal market, like uh, if you say, if if we sell into a feedlot, particularly, mm-hmm. they look for conform like the, the conformality of the animal it must be of a certain frame so that when they feed they can realize the the profit margin. Mm-hmm. So they look for 
conformality. <laughs> Sorry about uh, and uh, the type of frame as well. Because what, what tends to happen is that if you have a smaller type, uh, smaller frame uh, winner, they tend to penalize you. Why? Because those animals take longer to to adjust to feed, thus remaining longer on the feedlot, thus mm -hmm. leading to loss for them. So in terms of that aspect, your genetics also need to be quite. Uh, uh, you need to look at your genetics really uh, quite uh, strictly because you have to constantly introduce new genetics to ensure that you realize better uh, weights, uh, faster. Because another thing that uh, feed lots also tend to do, also look at feed conversion. So if your animals are known, or rather your weaners are known for uh, converting feed at a faster rate than others, the feed lot will like your animals and most likely will pay your premium. Why? Because they're realizing a profit faster. So you're breeding in what the commercial for the, the feedlot wants. And again, with regards to the, 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 the commercial side, sometimes you're not breeding the winners. Sometimes you're breeding, or rather you're placing your old stock. So it might be an older bone, smaller type animal, which can be fed for a little bit and then slaughtered at an abato. So you also get abato buys at an auction. And guys, you see, okay, this animal... Uh, it's the, the farmer is getting rid of it, but I could potentially use it for maybe another season. And then that, after that season, I can take it to the arbiter myself. Now, with regards mm -hmm. to the informal market, the informal market, it depends really. Like the ceremony is you know, like right now, basically, um, where they want a specific color. Like from Guinea, they want a specific color, black and white, for example. And sometimes mm -hmm. they want the, the brown with the, the black uh, mix, almost like a jersey cow. So, and and, and they attract their, their specific prices as well because the buyer will call you and be like, I want this animal, you know? And then you, you, you pass it on to the farmers and the farmers will be like, I'm looking for this amount. You know, no weight, no market price. It's, it's, it's like demand on the spot, you know? And uh, it usually goes for, for the price, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. In rare instances like that, like you've mentioned, you know, some buyers will look for a specific specific cattle, uh, anguni, black and white, etc. So uh, with Lizwe meat, that, does it happen that you have to go travel around the Eastern Cape to look for specific cattle because maybe you might have heard that, you know, in the next two months, a specific buyer is looking for a specific breed of cattle. So does part of your auction process, um, especially when you're getting um, or interacting and having those conversations with the farmers, does it involve traveling around the Eastern Cape region and looking for also those rare breeds that you know, you know, you've kind of struck gold, so to say, because they are so uh, they are so uh, unique in, in the in the in their in their positioning in the way they've grown, etc. Yes, um, we travel a lot. I mean, we traversed <laughs> a, a long. I mean, we recently covered how much was. 100,000 kilometers within nine months. So <laughs> it's a lot of driving. But um, with regards to, to, to the contacting the sellers, um, the sellers you usually get hold of the marketers because they understand as well. They need to negotiate or rather play uh, buyers against each other. If I can get more buyers from this guy, I mean, I might as well go from that guy. But with mm -hmm. regards to specific breeds, you they tend to... Farmers or what's the word? Commercial farmers, particularly, they know how to to market themselves. But yeah. it's with the emerging farmers, which is quite difficult because I might be located in Matatia, for example, and the buyer is located in Islam, for example. In terms of logistics, not going to work out because the they're not selling in volume. But for commercial farmers selling hundred at a time, it makes sense. Mm. So in that aspect, I mean, and then they can. Yeah. Yeah, Pardon? how can you reach that gap as Lisa needs? Because you could obviously see the potential from you could obviously see the potential from the emerging farmer. I mean, rightfully so, a commercial farmer has gone to a commercial status because of years of farming and years of being in the game, you know. Yes. But for a person who's more knowledgeable and educated within this auction space, um, as Lisa Meat, as um how do you then bridge the gap between the, your communication with the emerging farmers? Do you just leave them desolate or is there trade? involved and teaching them the business of auctioning as well as the business of raising cattle so that they can meet at commercial status okay on that point um 
because we, before we started, when we op- operate in area, people didn't know what an auction was. So right. an auction takes about four hours. Um, it took longer. <laughs> it took basic <laughs> because we had to uh, explain it in the home language and then yeah, all yeah. the auction. So th- there was a, a lot of back and forth in between. So in terms of educating, another thing which we tend to do is that uh, there's a Fort Cox College, which is an agricultural college in Eastern Cape. Right next to it, there's a pre-primary school. I just can't get the name off the top of my head. So what do you usually do? We ask the, the, the principal to allow some of the classes to be closed for that particular day so that they can see. Because what, another thing which we've seen, we've grown up in farming. So we know from a, a small age, this is what the auction is mm. and what you learn from it. Sometimes you go there, you're not, you're not buying. You're just watching at the price and the killer. You're noticing what's going on in the industry. But because they, they are distant and not understand auction, they, 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 they sort of get shut off. Now, it's difficult as an emerging farmer to sort of catch up when the trainers already left the station. So mm-hmm. in that aspect, training the new farmers, because in the Eastern Cape, as you know, uh, unemployment is rife, especially among the youth. But the thing is, in the Eastern Cape, they, are, they, they, are, they have uh, space for communal farming. So they might not be able to get a job, but that does not necessarily mean they cannot sustain themselves. Mm. So mm. in that aspect, we, 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 uh, we also communicate with the principal of the college as well because they should be starting an auctioning course soon, which they didn't have previously because right. of the auction. So, yeah. 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 And tell me, for emerging farmers, is there any certification that needs to be um, supplied when they're going to go auction their cattle, Um, like traceability records, vaccination records? What sort of certification would you be expecting from the farmer? Um, We have a group for the farmers. It's basically all the farmers who attend our auctions and we have a former register. We put them into a group and then everything we hear which comes from agriculture because they do not have, well, some of them have the financing, some of them don't. So every information we get from the Department of Agriculture, we pass it on to the group. And then it's sort of a discussion as to what's going on and the likes. But with regards to certification, um, uh, Department of Agriculture offers uh, free veterinary services. Mm-hmm. So they, well, what we are, ask them to do is that they get the vet to certify the animal as being free of foot and mouth disease and other okay. diseases as well because yeah. at the end of the day it's going to serve them well if they do because it, sometimes you can see an animal and you can see this animal is not going to get the price which the farmer wants mm. and then they're sort of like no you guys are not paying but we sort of training them over time so it, it the, the guys that have worked with us from from for, for quite some time understand and then it's the new guys which you are onboarding. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, also, how do you hedge your risks um, as a trader, you know, in this space, especially where there are concerns around drought? And um, do you ever run out, run out of cattle to auction? So how do you hedge your risks as an auctioneer? Well, the Eastern Cape is the number one producer of livestock in South Africa. That's straight in, through and through. So in terms of numbers, the numbers are in the Eastern Cape. So in terms of hedging our risk, like we I previously said, I think, um, that we have a register. So in order to own an auction, you incur marketing costs and other overheads. So you need to ensure that there is at least a minimum amount. Mm. And then from there on, you add on, or there will be sellers that come in on the day so mm. that at least you're running at a, a profit from that minimum amount. In terms of drought, uh, if I look at the 2016 drought, for example, we haven't been operating for that long. But I look at the 2016 drought and what happened in the industry itself. The livestock was still sold. They didn't realize the prices which the farmers wanted. Why? Because the animals weighed a bit less. So, in terms of uh, consumption, now moving beyond uh, uh, auction, okay. in terms of consumption, in South Africa, we consume more than we are to produce. So, Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's sort of a uh, break even a bit, but yeah. Okay. So there's room for 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 livestock um, farmers in South Africa. Yeah. So just to close off our conversations tonight, which has been 
jam-packed with uh, information. Uh, when did you start uh, uh, Lisa Meat? Uh, uh, you know, you said you are the co-founder of Lisa Meat, and why specifically auction? Why did you not grow your own uh, livestock farm and become a, a mega Buddha of some sort? Uh, you know, um, and obviously feed into that um, uh, auction space within the Eastern Cape. So, why specifically? Um, uh, why did you decide with you and your co-founder to do auctions within the Eastern Cape? And when did you start your business? What year? Yeah, so my co-founder... Sorry, man, I think... Did you, did you say something? No, I said what, which year? Which year? Oh, yeah. I don't remember. I know it was 18. So 20, 2010, 2011. But the okay. thing is, me and my, my, my co-founder, we've known our families are basically being close-knit since it's what mm. primary school. So yeah. we've known each other quite some time. And uh, again, we're both uh, fourth-generation farmers individually in terms of our family businesses. Mm. But what we, we saw is that because we are, or rather uh, in those areas, the farmers do not have access to the market. Mm -hmm. Upcoming farmers like ourselves, I mean, we're 28 years old. And then you go to an area and you ask, okay, so you guys have this opportunity, you have the land, you have the rain, what, why don't you farm? And then the guy's like, no, we, we, we don't see money in agriculture. That's the basic, like, I'm converting from Kosa to, to English without. Yeah. But, but uh, one thing which you didn't understand is that because the father or the mother is currently not realizing the real market value for the livestock, it discourages the following generation to go into farming. So that's why we decided to do the auctioning. Why? Because if they can see someone of your skin type to be able to doing it, then it's mm -hmm. easier for them to do it as well. But again, mm -hmm. being fair, because in some of the areas which we collect livestock from, the guys are suffering from stock theft, which is rife mm -hmm. in some areas. Yeah. Uh, market speculators. Um, the, the one case in Simo, uh, the guy went into an area with his truck, brought in uh, 100,000 in cash, and said, okay, your animals were 4,000, 5,000. I'm paying you 5,000 on the spot. And because the guys were so desperate and didn't have access to the market, they let go of the livestock. Mm. So it's, 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 it's aspects like that which we, we break in because every day, livestock, regardless of who it comes from, it must go according to the price and the weight that mm. and the quality. So, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. And your business name is called Lizwe Meat. Over and yeah. above the opening is that, yes, we can hear you, Atankosi. Yes, can you hear me? Having the microphone. Yes, I can yeah. hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, but you can continue. I think it's back now. Sorry, right. man. The reception comes and goes in this area. Just feel. Oh, okay. No worries. We completely understand. Um, I think, so I just lost my, my question here, but for what I think maybe just to sum up our conversation, you've mentioned something quite critical around um, uh, theft. Does it happen? Uh, I think we just lost Atengosi. Um, we'll just wait for him to come back ask him two questions and then I think we can wrap up our conversation. So let's give him a minute to possibly come back. But I believe it's just been such a, an informative conversation this evening. And so um, I see the comment box is quite quiet. So if you have any questions for Atenkosi, please feel free to ask uh, whilst we have plus minus two, three minutes left of the show. Alternatively, I think you could reach out to them on social media platforms and also um, watch this specific conversation on the Private Property Farming Podcast uh, channel um, on our YouTube channel. So um, Atenkosi, I don't know if you can hear me. Ooh, it seems that he might have gone off, but thank you so much for watching. Uh, we were speaking to Atengosi Denga, who's the co-founder and managing director of Lizwe Meat. They're based in the Eastern Cape. And as you heard him, he's like the first or young, first uh, and youngest auction house in the Eastern Cape. Atengosi, thank you for coming back. Sorry, we lost you for a second there. I think just to wrap up the show, Atengosi, is that I just want to find out what next for Ulizwe Meat and also are you, over and above the auctioning, are you uh, uh, processing any livestock at this stage? Uh, you're on mute, so you can just unmute yourself, Atengosi. Thanks. Pardon, pardon me. 
Um, so, so that's where we, we want to, that's the end goal. But there are a couple of things which we are brewing and we can't uh, let it uh, know at this moment in time. Um, but yeah, uh, the future is bright, if I can put it simply. <laughs> All right. Just repeat that. I think from the first second or so, uh, we couldn't hear you where you said, um, are you looking to become a, an abattoir or just focus fully on auction houses? We didn't hear that response. Well, if you look at the, the abattoirs, just, just to give you a bit of information, abattoirs serve a function in the agriculture or in the livestock space. Uh, it's rare than Abato make profit margins because if you have a look at the value chain, it's primary producer and then the market at the end. Abato's are somewhere in between, so they fulfill the function. And if you're not slaughtering at a certain function or rather at a certain percentage of the capacity, you're losing weight. So uh, everything which you're alluding to, it's, it's what you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, it's a, it's it's a, what's, what's the word? It's unfortunate that we can't uh, let you know the specific, yeah. but um, it's, it's 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 in the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Atengosi, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. I thoroughly appreciate your time this evening, and I can imagine how busy you are. You know, having to run around uh, the entire province and possibly outside the province looking for cattle. So, when's your next auction, and where can people contact you and find you? All right. So uh, in terms of auctions, because we bring in a larger number of, of customers to auction sites, we mm. do on-farm auctions. Like we have one upcoming in Petty, where it's on a farm, so that we decrease the amount of people. Otherwise, you're going to have an issue in terms of COVID numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Of that, <laughs> we, we try to avoid that. But um, in terms of contacting us, we have a Facebook page, uh, Lisa Meet. Um, okay. They can contact either of us, either my partner or me, on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. So I'm on Tonga, or and then I'm also on Twitter if uh, farmers want to get a hold of me. And uh, yeah. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. We were just speaking to Atengosi Denga. Sorry for the uh, connection there earlier on, but we're glad that we had him back onto the show just to also um, give out his contact details for anybody who wants to reach him. And yeah, that's it. The Farming Podcast, we've wrapped it up for uh, this evening. And I hope you join us um, on Thursday for another jam-packed session conversation where we're here for you essentially at the farming podcast just to teach you more about agriculture to give you more insight in terms of the trades and the market prices and all the other things that happen along the value chain so if you have any suggestions of future topic topics that you want us to cover please feel free to contact us on our social media pages twitter um, instagram facebook and also just send those comments on our youtube channel and we'll ensure that we give you the right content thank you so much once again for supporting the podcast please subscribe to our youtube channel and i will see you on thursday that's it from me good night thank you